Hello, my name is Dr. Joe Childs. Welcome to our office. Today I'd like to discuss on this video uh, how we help ADHD. I want to tell you about our drug-free solution uh, to children who are suffering with ADHD or other neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so if you have a child or a teenager that's having a hard time in school, maybe they're having trouble focusing, maybe they're having some trouble sitting still, or maybe they have impulsivity, uh, maybe they're hyperactive, uh, maybe they're having issues with reading comprehension, or maybe they're having issues with reading. And uh, maybe you just went to your child's conference with the teacher, and you sat down, and uh, they told you, you know, they love your child, they think he's a, a great kid, however, he's really having some issues with uh, sitting still, or he can't focus, and uh, they're very concerned about his grades and his performance going forward. Um, so. I have three children, so I understand. I have a child, a, a teenager now, 17-year-old, 11th grader. I have a 5th uh, grader, and I also have a, a child that's 5 years old. So I understand you want the best for your child. Uh, I also understand that most parents um, don't want to put their children on the stimulant medication. So today I want to talk to you about a drug-free solution, a drug-free solution that most parents are not aware of, and uh, have never heard of. So I'm going to talk to you about this today. It's going to be a great video. Again, thanks for coming in. Before I, before I go into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a chiropractor, um, and uh, most people think chiropractors only treat patients with uh, neck pain and back pain and car accidents and headaches and things like that. But I went beyond the regular chiropractic training, and I became a board-certified chiropractic neurologist that's fellowship trained in functional neurology. So what is a chiropractic neurologist? Well, just like you can specialize in medicine and be a neurologist, you can be an orthopedist, cardiologist, things like that. In chiropractic, you can also specialize. So after the eight years of chiropractic school, you can go another uh, three years of postgraduate education, and uh, all these studies are in the brain. Now, the difference between us and a medical neurologist is a medical neurologist is going to treat with medications and treat with surgeries and things like that, whereas a, a chiropractic neurologist or a functional neurologist We'll treat without drugs, without surgery, and we'll treat with neurological exercises, nutrition, and things of that nature. I'm also fellowship trained in minor traumatic brain injury and concussions, so I see quite a few patients with concussions and head injuries. I'm trained in vestibular rehabilitation, which is uh, helping people with dizziness and vertigo and balance disorders. Um, I'm fellowship trained in childhood neurodevelopmental disorders, so within the functional neurology education, there is a division that is specific to just helping children uh, with, uh, with childhood neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD and autism and things of that nature. I've, I've done that. I'm trained in functional nutrition and blood chemistry, so we do a lot of nutrition in our office. And of course, I do some of the things that, you know, of course, spinal decompression and biomechanics, and we help patients with chronic pain. I'm an exercise physiologist from Penn State before I did chiropractic. And I also have a uh, fellowship in chiropractic pediatrics. So that's a little bit about myself. Let's get talking about ADHD. Well, what I want to do first is tell you what makes us different from any other doctor, any other therapist, any other tutor you've taken to your child to. So we're going to talk about that. Well, number one is we treat ADHD and ADD and other neurodevelopmental disorders metabolically, which is nutritionally, and neurologically. And the most important thing for you to understand is there is a drug-free solution to helping children with these issues. Okay? One thing that we want to do in our office is we want to get to the root cause to the problem. We want to leave no stone unturned in trying to help your child uh, with ADHD. We want to find out the reason why they have it. We don't want to just give them a medication and cover up the symptoms of hyperactivity and poor focus and poor reading comprehension and all these things. We want to find out where in your child's brain is this issue occurring. Before we talk about how we do that, let me talk about a couple shocking facts about ADD and ADHD. Out of 100 people with ADHD, very interesting to know, 35 do not finish high school. Again, I have three children, and as a parent, we want the best for our children. We want them to do great things. We want them to do better things than we have done. And if you have a child with ADHD, you're really reducing your chances of, of a child even finishing high school. 25 are going to repeat at least one letter grade, and 52 of 100 are abusing drugs and alcohol. So it increases your chances so, uh, of a child having a problem with drugs or alcohol. That's scary in itself. Um, out of 100 people with ADHD, 40 have tried alcohol and tobacco at an early age, 19 are smoking cigarettes, 
as compared to a 10% national average. So having ADHD, having that label, really puts you into a, a you know a higher percentage of some things we, parents don't want to see. Out of 100 people with ADHD, 75 have interpersonal problems, have trouble with social skills. That's because areas of the right brain uh, in ADHD kids is, a, is used for social function. 20 have set fires, that's a level of impulsivity. 30 have engaged in theft, another thing that's impulsive. Uh, thir uh, 25 will be expelled from school for bad conduct. Pretty scary, right? Parents of ADHD children divorce three times more often than the general population. So having a child with these types of issues can be stressful on the family. That's why if uh, after today you decide to have your child have uh, step two and step three, which is an examination in our report of findings, uh, we make it mandatory that both parents attend uh, at least the report of findings step three and highly recommend that they attend the, the exam, even if they're divorced, uh, even if you're divorced, because uh, it's important that both parents are on, on board in helping their child. Now here's the thing, the use of Ritalin and other stimulant drugs have increased over 700% since the 1990s. 90% 90 of the world's Ritalin is consumed in this country, so we take the most, dr most stimulant drugs. Last year, doctors in the United States wrote, uh, wrote an estimated 20, billion, uh, 20 million prescriptions for Ritalin and other stimulant drugs. It's a $4 billion industry. So typically when you go out, uh, you take your child to a doctor, you say, listen, he's, he's hyper, he's, he's having trouble sitting still in school, he can't focus. They're not going to be looking for the alternatives. They're going to be looking for the medical, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical approach and because it's a big industry. ADHD is a leading disorder in the world and Ritalin is the most widely prescribed uh, medication for children. The key points I want you to understand is ADHD is, is reversible. It can be improved. It's a developmental problem. It's because parts of the brain are not developing the way they should uh, or as quick as they should. It's not reversible with drugs. Drugs do not actually fix the problem. They only mask the symptoms. And again, just what I said, drugs do not mask, they, they don't fix the problem. They mask the symptoms. Stimulant medications have side effects. There's not one parent that ever comes into my office, and we've been treating children with these problems uh, for over 10 years. They come into our office and they almost always across the board say, I would rather them not be on the medications, but I don't know what to do. Uh, and the reason why is they know the side effects. I mean, you take, the, you, you take it home, you read the white piece of paper, anorexia, a lot of kids will not want to eat, they lose their appetite, they have insomnia, weight loss, they become hyper emotional at times, they can have depression, it can really affect the, the way uh, digestion occurs so they can get ab abdominal pain. Seizures, kids, it increases the chance of having seizures. Kids can become dizzy, their heart can, can race, they can get mood swings, dry mouth, vision issues. These are things, these are the unwanted effects of the, of the stimulant medications. And this, a study from the FDA found, uh, the National Institute of Institutes of Health found that researchers found a 500% increase in the risk of sudden cardiac death in kids who took stimulant drugs like Ritalin because they are a stimulant drug. They, they race the heart. Uh, so what they went on to say is that kids before they go on to Ritalin or any of these different stimulant drugs, they should have an echocardiogram to make sure that they don't have something called a, like a long QT or they're not prone to this sudden, sudden death uh, or this sudden heart um, issue. So that, that's scary in itself. So if, if you are putting your child on the riddle in it or and things like that and their heart rate is increased, you should have that checked. Again, most parents are led to believe that their only choice is the stimulant medication. They're not given any other opportunities. Now, right now you're sitting in my office, so you're going to learn about that. But most people, all they think that they have out there are the medications, okay? Because we live in a very medicine, pharmaceutical-driven world. Statistics, there are some 16 million kids who are diagnosed with severe attention behavioral learning problems, so you're not alone. It's, it's a big problem in our country. It's increasing. We've got, uh, every day there's, there's children that are being diagnosed with not only, not only ADHD, autism, Asperger's syndrome, dyslexia, Tourette's syndrome, bipolar disorder. Um, th these are increasing. The, the, the rise in childhood neurodevelopmental disorders mostly described as behavioral Social and academic dysfunction has risen so sharply, center of disease control and prevention called it a major health threat. Autism, interestingly enough, which 10 years ago was considered a rare disorder, affects one out of 80 children born, and now I mean, even the newer research is saying one out of 50, where it used to be one in 10,000 years ago. This year, 1.5 children entering school, that's one out of every six, five or six year olds, will be diagnosed with some type of neurological disorder that affects their ability to learn and socially interact. 
Now here's the key thing, the methods that doctors and psychologists and, 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 and behavioral specialists have used to diagnose and treat these disorders, they haven't changed in the last 50 years. It's exactly the same way. They do usually surveys of the parents, say, what are you finding with your child? They just observe them. They usually don't do a neurological exam in any way. They're not really looking for the root cause. They just say, yeah, he looks like he's hyper. Take this medication. So Albert Einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So we've got an increase, an increase, an increase of all these problems, but we're doing exactly the same exact methods over the last 50 years. So that's, you know, that's the definition of insanity. So what is, our, what is our approach? We want to treat the child, not the diagnosis. What's the difference of a functional versus a traditional diagnosis? Well, we have to be very careful about the labels that we put on our children. The emotional self-esteem of the child alone is reason to be very careful about saying, son or daughter, you have ADHD. That could be very... Um, can affect their, their self-esteem, it can affect how they function in school. So it's really not getting at the root cause. So what's the difference between a functional and a traditional di uh, diagnosis? Is we know that ADHD is a set of symptoms. It's not really what's causing the problems. So we want to look at areas of your child's brain by doing specific tests. Is it a frontal lobe problem? Is it the medial frontal lobe? Is it the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? So we look at the brain and nervous system, and we want to find out which area in, in your child's brain is actually causing the problem. Instead of just naming it, we want to find out which areas are really causing it. So that's a functional. We look at the areas of the child's brains and nervous system. Now there's really three types of ADHD. There's type 1, type 2, and type 3. They don't really call it ADD anymore. They call it ADHD. So type 1 is just being distractible, just having poor focus, poor attention, poor motivation. That's a problem with the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which controls focus. Type 2 is impulsivity, hyperactivity, and inhibition problems. That's the medial orbital frontal cortex that's usually involved there. And type 3 is a combination of both. So we're just not saying your child has type 1 or type 2. We're going to say, you know what, we think your child has some uh, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex issue and a little bit of media wall issues, this is what we want to do to help that. What is a functional disconnection? So we want to talk about a functional disconnection. So it's an electrical, electrical imbalance that interferes with the two right and left hemispheres to be able to share and integrate information, meaning the brain is not working as a whole. Children with these types of issues have a functional disconnection syndrome. Let's talk more about it. So in order for your human brain to work good, to be in sync with each other, to work as a whole, the left and right hemispheres must be in constant communication with each other. They must, must be equally strong so they can communicate effectively. The two sides must be able to keep up, up with each other. They must be in synchronization. So children with ADHD typically have deficiencies in the right side of their brain. So what that's going to create, if your child has a functional disconnection syndrome, it's going to result in a child that has unusually strong or very good skills associated with one side of the brain and very low function or unusually bad skills associated with the underactive side. So they have it, it's a, it's a disconnection between the two. Now it's a functional disconnection, meaning the, the connections there, structurally the connections there, so it's not, we, I, have, I have had children that have um, agenesis or they, they, they have not developed their corpus callosum which connects the two hemispheres. But a functional disconnection means all the wiring's there, it just means that the, the, the hemispheres are working independently of each other, creating a brain imbalance. The, this causes disorders like ADHD, Asperger's, autism. They may manifest with different symptoms but they're really one and the same problem. Uh, just depending upon how much of the areas are affected. So, meaning that the brain, especially the two hemispheres of the brain, are underdeveloped and they're not electrically balanced or in synchronization with each other. So what are some right brain deficiencies? Or what are some, you know, if you have a deficiency of the right brain? ADD and ADHD are a right brain deficiency. Asperger syndrome, which is a right brain autism. These are children that are sort of completely focused on small details. They have poor social skills. They have poor eye contact. Autism is a higher version of that, and you can get Tourette syndrome, OCD, PDD-NOS is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Left brain deficiencies are more verbal issues, 
learning disabilities, dyslexia. So children that have functional disconnections, so a child with ADD or ADHD, they may only have one area of the right brain that's affected where autism is the complete right side of the brain causing a, a ton of symptoms. Uh, but every child with autism has ADHD, okay? So let's talk about the hemispheres here. So we've got the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. If we understand what they do, you can, uh, you can start to understand the difference between a functional disconnection. So the left hemisphere is the gas pedal, where the right hemisphere is the brake pedal. It breaks, stop, breaks thoughts, it breaks activity, it breaks motion and movement. So a child with a high functioning left and a low functioning right can't turn off. They can't filter things out. Your frontal lobes are the filter. So right now you are filtering out everything going on, anything else that you can hear, but you're listening to me. A child with ADHD, because the gas pedal is on and the brake pedal is not on, they cannot filter out um, things. So if they're sitting in class, they're trying to listen to the teacher, they should be listening to the teacher, and what they do is they hear every, everything else out there. They hear every other thing. But they're not actually listening to the teacher. They hear the birds chirp and they hear somebody walking down the hall. Small, the left hemisphere is small picture in details. The right picture is big, it, right, the right brain is big picture. So children with, with, uh, with ADHD can't see the big picture. So they can read fine, but they don't get anything that they read. They can't comprehend the big picture, the underlining meaning. Uh, the left brain is approach, so it initiates movement, it initiates thought. The right brain with, is withdraw, so for you to listen to me, you have to withdraw from everything else. The left brain controls fine motor movements, where the right brain controls gross motor movements like posture. So not all children, but most kids with ADHD will be a little bit more clumsy. Not in every case. It depends how badly it's affected, because I do have some very good athletes with ADD and ADHD. Um, left brain is memorization of facts. These are kids with hyper left brains are going to be the, your, your Ashburgers kids. They'll, they're really good with facts and figures, but they don't know how those facts and figures sort of uh, work in the, in the big uh, scheme of things. The left brain likes routine, it likes same, sameness. So these are children with uh, these neurodevelopmental disorders like to keep things everything the same. They don't like new things. The right brain is more creative, nonverbal, things like that. And, and the right brain is reading and math comprehension. It's the ability to comprehend the big picture. So you can see if a child has a, right, uh, a deficient right brain, they can, be, uh, they can have poor focus, poor attention, uh, things like that. So functional disconnection, one side of the brain is maturing at a faster rate than the other side, and that's why a child develops these imbalances. So when the brain is out of balance, you can have poor body awareness or something called proprioception. So we're going to talk about the things that happen when you have this disconnection. Proprioception is your body's way of telling you where you are in space. So children with ADD and ADHD or even further down that right brain spectrum, the spectrum is what we call it, um, they can have problems with proprioception. They don't feel their body the way they should feel their body. They may not have good coordinated movements, things of that nature. They may not have embodiment. So people with functional disconnection or children, they don't physically feel the same as other children. They don't feel their bodies as well. So their social skills are not as good. I can understand what a person cannot what a person is feeling on their face expressions and things like that based on how I know that would feel on me. That allows me to, to have empathy and things of that nature. So children with a functional disconnection syndrome, especially if it's a further down the line of the spectrum, are going to have problems with the way they feel their bodies. They're going to feel disconnected. They're not going to feel orientated. And that creates disturbing behavior. It's going to create impulsive issues. It's going to make them not act the way they should act in certain situations. They're going to be left-handed and right-footed. Footed. So the brain, uh, when it's when it's completely functioning and it's connected, you'll have it. You'll be completely left-handed, left-footed, and left-eyed and left-eared. But if you are a child with disconnection, you may have be right right-footed, left arm, things like that. You may have poor eye eye coordination, poor social skills, poor gross and fine motor skills, persistence of primitive reflexes. Let's talk about primitive reflexes. So when a child is born and they're just an infant, all of their movement is not necessarily voluntary, it's more reflexual or happen involuntarily. It's all in the brain stem. The brain stem is very well developed in a, in a baby, but they've not developed their cortex. So the brain stem 
is in here, and in the brainstem is where all internal function and reflexes happen. This is where all voluntary function, voluntary movement, thought, and things of that nature. So they're, they have these primitive reflexes. So some children have these reflexes um, still there or persistent if they have ADD and ADHD. So what are some primitive reflexes? So if you, if you go like this with a baby, they, they, they grasp. It's called the grasping reflex. You go like this on their mouth, they start to root. Uh, you stroke, stroke the bottom of their foot, their toe sticks up. That's a normal reflex uh, for a baby. But after a year, they should be gone. Kids that have deficiencies in development will have retained or persistent primitive reflexes. One that we test is the spinal gallant reflex, and that's when you stroke a baby's back and they kind of they kind of bend, and that helps them get out of the birth canal in the birthing process. But if it's persistent, if it's in a child that's even a a six or seven or eight year old or even a teenager or even an adult for that matter, it can have a, make a child be fidgety, can cause them to have bedwetting, poor concentration, poor short term memory. So we want to test those. And we do that in our examination. Retain persistent, another one is the asymmetrical tonic neck. If you turn a kid's, if you turn a baby's head, their arm, this side will straighten out and this side will bend. If it's persistent, so if we do it in an older child, this, he should not have this reflex. This is a normal reflex which saves a baby from falling off of a table or something like that. If you turn a child's head and their arm bends like that, then it's a persistent reflex and that can create poor balance, trouble with cross pattern movements, trouble with eye movements and pursuits, which can create problems with poor handwriting, visual perceptual difficulties, which is things that will affect learning. And then another one is the Morrow response. If you drop a, if you take a baby and you sort of drop them like that, but you're still holding on to them, their arms go like this. And that is a, uh, an infantile fight or flight response. So we do this with, with adults, we check them, or we do this with, with teenagers, and we do this with uh, six and seven year old kids. And if they have a routine Morrow reflex, if it's persistent, they can have anxiety, mood swings, excessive reaction to stimuli, tense muscles, hyperactivity, and insecurity. So these are things that we see. So we do exercises to get rid of these things, and if we can, or, or, to, or to remediate them, a better term. And uh, if they go away, then the child's brain will develop better. Children with, bad, with a deficient brain can have abnormal emotional reactions, sensory processing symptoms. They may be fussy eaters. They may not like the texture of foods, things of that nature. They can have a rapid heartbeat because the brain, when it's developed, it naturally slows down the heartbeat. So this is why a, child, a baby has like a 200 heart, heart rate, whereas a child develops and gets, as their brain starts to develop, they start having uh, you know, a good heart function and the heart rate comes down and, it, and, it, and the digestion starts to function better. So we want to fix the disconnect. If we get the immature side of the brain to catch up with the other side, the symptoms get better and so does the disorder. So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. What does that mean? It means that you know, nothing happened to their brain to make it go backwards, uh, like, like a child with a concussion. That's a child with a brain that was here and went backwards. This is a child that has a brain that hasn't developed to where it should be evenly and creates these issues. So when we improve these, how we improve them is fuel. The brain needs fuel and it needs activation or stimulation for it to develop. Fuel is good nutrition and oxygen, and activation is the neurological stimulations. That's what a brain needs to function. So we treat ADHD nutritionally, that's fuel, and neurologically, which is the stimulation. We can get into the, how the brain develops, but the most important thing is new brain synapses are dependent upon two things for growth, fuel in oxygen and glucose, and stimulation. Without stimulation, the brain doesn't grow. And they did tests on children that don't play much or rarely touch, their brain develops smaller. So we know that if we stimulate the brain, it can function. The sensations that we get, the seeing, the hearing, the touch, the balance, the coordinated movement, the movement in our head, will eventually, these sensations are transformed into mental stimulation. The more the brain cell is stimulated, the more it will increase in size and processing speed, strength and its connections to form new synapses. So in the womb, the, the right brain is the side that develops the, the most in the first two years of life. The left is developing, not, but not as quick. So around age two, it switches to the left side. This is why we see more right brain deficiencies than left brain deficiencies in children. 
And so from then on, we're going to see it switch back and forth. So some children have some issues with that development from the birth process on this to age two, and this is one way they get um, uh, functional disconnection syndrome. I could tell, talk a whole 30 minutes on how it actually happens, uh, but let's talk about more about what we do to help it, okay? So what I want you to understand is we use a bottom-up neurological treatment strategy. So here's the thing, there's like a hierarchy of the development of your child's brain and function. So way up at the top we have academic learning, the ability to learn, the ability to do math, and the ability to do that stuff. All the way down at the bottom when you're a baby you have vestibular and inner ear reflexes, you have touch, you have proprioception, so as the baby moves its head, and then we have our sensory system which is smells and vision and and taste and things like that and we've got motor planning and postural development and then we've got uh, reflex maturity okay which we just talked about and then we got eye hand coordination and ocular motor control and then we'd start developing attention and function and then behavior and then academic learning so when a child comes in and has problems with academic learning behavior at the top of the pyramid Traditionally what they do is they try to fix that by making you do more academic learning, tutoring and things like that. Or, and they try to affect behavior by saying you have to sit still, you can't do that. But the child is doing that sometimes out of reflex. Okay, So what we do is we go back and we check how is your child's vestibular function, how is their auditory function, how are their reflexes, how is their eye movements and their eye hand coordination and we fix those things which then give your child the palate to develop academic learning. So that's the bottom-up strategy instead of the top-down strategy and that's, it's highly effective, okay? Especially if you combine it with the tutoring. We're not saying tutors aren't good and we're not saying therapists aren't good and things of that nature. So I hope that makes sense to you. So we do neurological treatments based on specific neurological testing. We're going to find out which area of your child's brain is working good, which area is not working good. Is it the frontal lobe? Is it the cerebellum? And we can do that by specific tests that tell us these areas. Painless tests. Nothing really, uh, nothing hurts your child or anything like that through the exam process. So step two, right now you're in step one, which is the consultation. Step two which I'll be coming in in just a minute to talk to you, but step two is the functional brain assessment where we do a comprehensive questionnaire. We're going to do something called interactive met metronome testing. We're going to look at reflexes we just talked about, muscle tone, balance and coordination, sensory testing, eye movements. These are the things that we're going to do. Uh, and we're going to look at previous testing. Where have you had your child? What have you done? Things of that nature. And we may look at some, of course, we're going to look at some lab tests as well. We're going to look at eye movements. Eye movements are so essential because they involve every area of the brain. Very important. In fact, your eyes are actually just an extension of your brain. So it's the only part of your brain you can see from the outside. Your eyes are neurological tissue. So we look at eye movements. We do a video nystagmograph testing. So we put your child, uh, we don't do this with the real young kids because we don't want to scare them, put them in these goggles, but these goggles are no different than just a uh, like a set of uh, swimming goggles you use in a pool. We put these on, only they have a fancy camera there. And then they look at this screen, and when they look at the screen, uh, what will happen is we can actually measure the way their eye movements are working. So we look at a couple things. We're going to look at how stable is their gaze. Kids with ADHD, their gaze isn't stable. They're, if they are looking at something, their eyes are bouncing and moving all over the place. We'll look at the smoothness of the, how good they can track, which is essential for reading. How fast they can switch and how accurate they can switch their, their gaze from one target to another. Optokinetics is when a, uh, uh, um, something goes down, a visual surround passes them and, and does their eye pick up this reflex. Uh, it's called the vestibular ocular reflex. So we, t we test that, it graphs out and it lets us know what eye movements are good, what eye movements are fully developed, which ones are having issues. And then we develop a specific vision therapy approach to help a child with these issues. We also do something called saccadometry. Saccades are fast eye movements from left to right. So when I look to the left, that's my right brain that controls that. When I look to the right, that's my left brain. So the red ones here are to the left, which is right brain. The green ones are to the right, which is left brain. And so what we can do is we put this little harness on a child's head. Uh, and what we can do is we can measure um, the speed of these eye movements and see if they're accurate and see if they're working well and it'll let us know which side of the brain is maybe working good and not so good. Um, the, the saccadic movements are controlled by that focus center called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So has your child had all these tests performed by other doctors? 
Most of the time you take your, ch take your child to the pediatrician, you say he's hyper, he kind of looks at him for a few minutes, doesn't barely do any reflexes, doesn't do any eye movement testing, nothing, and says, okay, here you go, take the medication. We want to find out what area of your child's brain is not working so good. Okay, we use breakthrough neurological therapies and sensory motor stimulations and exercises to improve brain function. So we do things, once we find out which areas of the brain are not functioning good, we can use those eye movements and those stimulations to affect the brain. So we do eye exercises, we do gaze stability exercises, we'll do core stability exercises, we do rhythm training, which the frontal lobe controls that. Interactive metronome, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Auditory stimulation, proprioceptive stimulation, which is using muscle tone and activities in balance, balance and vestibular training, fine and gross motor. We do things to get rid of that or to remediate those primitive reflexes. Strength training, muscle tr stretching, vestibular stimulation. These are vestibular's inner ear. So these are some of the things that we do. And it's all an attempt to develop neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity basically means this. Neuro means brain or nerve. Plastic means moldable, like plastic is moldable, meaning your brain is moldable to the stimulation that it gets. We just talked about how does the brain develop? Develops with stimulation and fuel. So if we give a child good nutrition and we stimulate the areas of the brain that aren't working so good, we can create change, not only in those eye movements, but in the behaviors you're concerned about. Maybe your child's, child's hyperactive and we, in, we improve the filter or the brake pedal in his brain and now he's not hyperactive. So your brain can change. I don't care how old you are. Even if you're 90, your brain can change, especially a child's brain. So if you, you look, go home and Google neuroplasticity. It's the hottest word in neuroscience currently. So we activate the brain with balance training, we'll have them wear these headphones and they'll have to focus on this computer and they have to, they'll have to focus and completely uh, sort of filter out everything and do a gross uh, motor and sensory and visual uh, function. We may use some things called eye lights, we'll use brain based music, we'll do adjustments on the spine, this is where the chiropractic is pulled in. We know that if we adjust the left side of the body that will affect the right side of the brain. We don't have to crack and pop or the spine like we would for somebody with headaches and neck pain. We can just use an instrument. It creates a little tapping on the joints and that will stimulate the opposite side of the brain. Smells we can use. So here's, you know, there's multiple treatment examples. We'll use cross-crawling mechanisms where we use one side of the body crossing over with balance, gaze stability exercises. These are all things that we do. We use interactive metronome. Uh, this, this is a, one of the greatest things that we use in our practice, and this is one of the studies. They found that it was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study of 9 to 12-year-old boys diagnosed with ADHD found those undergoing just, just interactive metronome, which is one of 20 different things, 30 different things that we do in our practice, uh, showed a st uh, statistically significant improvements over both control groups in intention, concentration, motor control, coordination, language processing, reading fluency, and control of aggression. This came from the American Journal of Occupational Therapy. So this is one therapy we, we do in our practice. We use this thing called sensory uh, motor integration, which is this touch, uh, touch tone screen where a child can do eye exercises, they can use it interactively, they touch the screen. Uh, that can, we can use, uh, put words across where they have to visually remember those words and then and then find them and touch them and it, it, it integrates gross motor, balance, and eye movements together. It's a great therapy. We added that to our practice about five years ago. We can do visual stimulation with checkerboards and things of that nature. Right? Now here's the thing. So what happens is let's talk about how, how stimulant medications work. So stimul stimulant medications work. Uh, they really, it's a stimulant, it bursts the amount of dopamine in the system, and what that does is it makes the brain fire faster on both sides. So if a child has a deficiency on one side of the brain versus the other, so let's say the right brain is deficient, and they take, or in this case, we'll just say the left brain is deficient. So be, this is the brain output before. Both sides are sorted down, the left side is worse than the right. You take the treatment, which is the stimulant medication, and what happens is the child, both sides of the brain increase but it doesn't do anything for the disconnect, meaning it doesn't do anything to create balance and synchronization. It just makes the brain fire faster. Now it works, meaning the child can focus better when they're on the drugs, but as soon as they're off the drugs, the focusing goes away because they're not training, they're not creating, the chemicals do not create plastic change in the brain. And then they become very dependent upon these drugs. I mean, these, yeah, these drugs. 
So your traditional treatments are medications, occupational therapy, which can be good, but occupational therapy does not have a what part of the brain is the problem uh, specificity. It's just overall sort of exercise like joining a gym. Behavioral therapy, we love the work. I think behavioral therapy and what we do, great combination counseling, especially for kids that have more problems than just neurological. They may have had emotional problems, they've had abuse or something like that. Educational therapy, our program works great. And it's, if you have a tutor working, it's a great combination. In fact, tutors are like, I don't know what you're doing, but he's really starting to take off. Um, so these are some of the things we do. Now, here's our typical ADHD treatment plan. So remember, we're trying to stimulate the weak areas of the brain to create lasting change in the child's brain or neuroplasticity. One of the, one of the big things that parents always ask is, how long will this last? Will this, will this last? And what I tell them is, once you learn how to ride a bike, you always learn how to ride a bike. So once you make these pathways become online and developed, they don't go backwards unless you sit your child in front of a, a TV all day, let them play video games all day and drink, uh, drink you know, Orange Crush or something, and then that may make their brain not work good. But once we get something, you don't have to keep doing this to keep it. But it takes time and repetition. The care plan is usually two to three one-hour sessions per week for about three months. That's typical, not the same for everybody, but usually two or three one-hour sessions. So it's going to be a little bit of, uh, you're going to have to make a commitment to this. We do a re-exam every 10 to 15 sessions to check and see if objectively things are doing better. And you'll have to do some neurological homework, probably about 10 minutes on the days that he's, uh, he or she's not in the office. So it's not too bad, but you're going to have to commit to uh, two to three one-hour sessions per week for three months. Okay? We work with other providers, child psychologists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, teachers, pediatricians. We want to be in the loop with them. We can call them, talk to them, let them know what we're doing completely. We're 100%. We're, we're not against any of these things. These are all great practitioners. We just think that we want to make sure that that child's bottom-up to the top-up approach is being affected with what we do. So remember, brain needs two things. We just talked a ton about the activation. Let's talk a little bit about the fuel, which is the nutrition side of things. We do metabolic or nutritional care. It's specific, individualized nutritional recommendations based on your child's blood work. So what we'll do is we'll either look at past blood work that your child's had, or after day two, uh, we may send the child out for some blood work, or we may wait and do that after day three. We may want to look at things to see how things are doing. And then we use the latest functional medicine or nutrition, drug-free nutrition, to help support brain development and function. So we'll test things for like hypoglycemia. Some children uh, have low blood sugar, so that one of the problems, they may be at school and their blood sugar crashes and now suddenly they can't focus. They may have fatty acid deficiencies, anemia, which means not enough uh, iron in your blood or not enough red blood cells. Can, you know, anem uh, your red blood cells carry oxygen to your brain, so anemia can certainly cause a child to have a deficiency in focus. We see a lot of kids with anemia because most ki a lot of kids don't like to eat a lot of meat. They eat, they, uh, or a lot of healthy nuts and seeds and vegetables. They eat like carbs and macaroni and cheese. Inflammation, which means the brain is sort of, uh, you know, slightly... Uh, the word is inflamed. It's kind of like if I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's going to get red and swell. Imagine if like that's going on all through the body and just a little bit in the brain, and that can affect the way the brain functions. Food sensitivities, stress hormones, uh, leaky gut, and then some children have some poor gut health from a lot of antibiotics. They can have uh, high bacteria uh, or poor bacteria in their gut. Food sensitivities, we really like to test for this. We like to test for the big six, which is gluten sensitivity, soy sensitivity, egg sensitivity, dairy, yeast, and corn. And uh, so food sensitivity, what can happen with that is your, your, your immune system reacts to the food and it creates antibodies and inflammation that eventually can get into the brain, cross the blood-brain barrier, and, and cause the brain to kind of not work as good. Now, a lot of times parents will say to me, Doc, my child's already had been to an allergist, he's had the skin prick test, and there's no allergies. Well, what's the difference between allergies and sensitivities? Allergies cause immediate reactions like hives and wheezing and itching. It's instantaneous. This is the kids that eat the peanuts, and it's a medical emergency. It happens very quickly. But they don't have a negative effect on the gut and the brain. Okay? The food allergies. Food sensitivities are not going to create an immediate problem, but they do affect the brain. So your child eats gluten, 
and then an hour later you're like looking at him and there doesn't seem you know he should be I don't think gluten's affecting him but the next week he's having a, a tough time in school focusing because it, it creates brain inflammation that's delayed so we want to test that now what happens with gluten and casein is they can get up into the brain and create what's called gluteomorphin and caseomorphin which they attach to the opioid receptors in the brain which results in a sort of spacey zoned out sort of unfocused child and they get tantrums unless they get the uh, you know the, the macaroni and cheese the pastas the breads and things like that these are kids that just crave these things um, so we want to check for that and, and this is why ki some kids are just nuts about it. that's all they want to eat are carbs and, and dairy and it, it really affects the brain We'll do neurotransmitter support. So neurotransmitters are dopamine, GABA, and serotonin. These are neurotransmitters in your brain. And we don't give the drug, like giving a stimulant drug affects dopamine. Giving a child something like Zoloft or Paxil affects serotonin. What we want to do is we give them nutrient cofactors that promote their own body's production of these things. So as we do brain stimulations, we may give them on a nice nutritional support to help them make their own dopamine so they can have their own sort of like natural chemistry that causes them to have better focus and things of that nature, right? GABA is really good for hyperactive kids. So these are cofactors. We don't just give it to them because if you give it to your brain, your brain's going to make less of it. Food sensitivities can cause all kinds of issues, irritability, impulsivity, aggressiveness, fatigue, bedwetting. Bedwetting usually means that the frontal lobes are not working good or not developed. Learning disabilities, lack of attention, poor digestion. So we want to check and see if your child has food sensitivities. Leaky gut testing. Sometimes children, if they have such bad food sensitivities, will develop uh, microscopically a GI tract that is not doing a good job of uh, separating the inside of the intestines to the bloodstream. So your intestines absorb food. It should absorb only fully digested foods into the bloodstream. So fully digested foods get through the, through the digestive tract, and then they get down to their smallest constituents, like amino acids and things like that, and they should slip through these tight junctions. And then when they get into the bloodstream, they do their purpose, and they're not recognized by the immune system. But if you develop a leaky gut, which means the junctions become open, then not fully digested foods, bacteria, gluten, things like that can get into the bloodstream and that's how you develop a inflammatory response to foods and things of that nature. Food sensitivities cause uh, GI uh, health issues and leaky gut. American diet causes a lot of this. Uh, so the way we tr uh, food, feed kids today is, is, is absolutely crazy. The school lunches that you, that you feed your child, big problem. It's amazing that these kids Half the, half the kids are going down for their medications, but then they go back and they eat terrible food with, loaded with all these prop, the things. Sometimes what we want to test, we can do a stool test to see if your child has good bacteria. This is, a, this is very important for children that have had a lot of antibiotics from ear infections and things like that because the gut can become very unhealthy uh, if there's not good bacteria. They can get parasites and yeast and things like that. So how, so how are we different? We're going to finish here in just a minute. And I'm going to be coming in to talk to you. We, th this is our approach. The functional neurological approach is we want to determine what areas of the brain are underdeveloped and not functioning optimally. We then use evidence-based drug-free neurological therapies and nutritional protocols to create lasting improvements or neuroplasticity in the under-functioning brain re regions responsible for ADHD. Stimulant medications are used to cover up the symptoms associated with ADHD by temporarily chemically altering the function of the brain. They are not intended to reverse the neurological dysfunction or create lasting functional change. So that's what happens. They just mask the symptoms when we're looking for the cause. If your child's on the medication, when they come here, we're not going to say, oh, get off the medication. We're, we're doing the natural thing now. What we'll say is this. Keep them on the medication. We're going to improve the brain. It doesn't, it's not a problem that he's on the medication for this time, but as we improve the brain and as we see improvements in his function, then you can go back to the doctor and you can get off of the medication. I can't tell you to go off of that medication, but your medical doctor can start to wean the child off, and now the brain is where it should be and they need less or no medication. So results, our program is extremely successful, uh, in part because of what we do. Okay, And, and then the second reason 
is because we only accept patients who we think we're going to help, okay? Um, so we really look at the child to see if it's a true neurological cause of the problem. A couple questions. How has your child's ADHD affected your relationships, family, finances, and other activities? It's something to think about. You know, ADHD really puts a stress and strain on the family. Are you concerned that your child's ADHD will never resolve? And because what will happen is children with ADHD, and all they do is the medications, all they do is mask the symptoms, it follows them through uh, their young adult life and their adult life. Okay? Are you concerned about the side effects? So if you're a parent that's concerned about these side effects and are concerned about not getting at the true cause, then possibly you want to go through with what we call step two. Are you interested in addressing the root cause of your child's ADHD rather than masking the symptoms with medication? If you're somebody that's looking for this and looking for the root cause, then I think maybe going on to step two or step three would be important. Step two is a functional neurological exam. We're going to do everything that we just talked about. We're going to find what area of your child's brain is, is at, co at cause of the problem. Uh, we're going to find out if your child even has a neurological problem. Maybe it's not neurological. Maybe we say, you know what, we're not the doctor for you, for your child. And then step two is we do a report of findings where we go over everything with you. We'll sit down, go over the eye movement testing, the full exam. We'll go over any blood work that we may have sent your child out for. Uh, maybe we don't do any blood work this, on step three. We'll decide. It'll be up to you. So that's step two and step three. So if you're really interested in finding out if your child has this issue and it can be helped drug-free, I would recommend you schedule that. So again, these are all the things that we do in step two. It's, a, it's about an hour uh, long uh, process. Okay? So thanks for listening. I'm going to be coming in right in just a moment and we'll sit down, we'll discuss your concerns that you have uh, about your child, your teenager. I will answer all your questions and then at that point we'll decide uh, and you'll decide whether uh, you want to go on with step two and uh, potentially step three. So thanks for listening. I'm going to be coming in just a minute. Take care. Hi Jason. Um, well, could you tell us uh, some of the current concerns you were having with your son, Owen, uh, prior to coming into the office? Sure. Um, prior to coming to see Dr. Giles and Dr. Durr, uh, Owen had been diagnosed um, with ODD, uh, Asperger's, ADHD. Um, we have gone through some significant behavioral uh, problems with Owen for several years. Um, physical aggression, verbal aggression, uh, we've tried every different medication under the sun, every medication cocktail to try and, you know, curb his behaviors, um, different treatment modalities, you know, going to see different psychologists, psychiatrists, um, just anything we could do to, to try and get him to improve his behavior, uh, anything that we could do to help him uh, with that. And nothing really seemed to work. Uh, we would get little glimpses of hope here on some of the medicines, but over time, bottom line, nothing really worked. Um, so we were running out of options. Uh, we found out about you guys here. Um, we figured we couldn't, couldn't hurt. <laughs> we, right. So, you know, we've uh, we looked into it, and we're still here. Um, you know, we did the initial lab work, and uh, Owen started. He's been here for several months now. He's in the second phase of treatment with you guys. So we're we're very happy. Um, we were having you know issues with focus at school. Uh, he was very inattentive. Uh, his focus was very difficult at school, very difficult at home. Uh, he was having behavioral issues at school as well, verbal, physical. Um, his grades were suffering. Uh, he wasn't learning the way he should be. He wasn't right. staying up to grade level on certain things. You know, he was great in, in classes like music and, mm -hmm. and art, things like that. He liked science, but other classes such as reading and math and some of the other academic courses, he wasn't doing as well. He was having a really hard time in those classes, couldn't sit still, fidgeting a lot, um, causing a lot of distractions in mm -hmm. class. Even if he wasn't having a meltdown, you know, he was bothering the other kids or mm -hmm. cursing at the teacher or just doing things for attention. So you know, there was a lot of significant problems. Well, since having care with Dr. Charles and Dr. Durr, what has improved? Uh, since we've been, since Owen's been under the care here, um, we seen a, a 180 in, in Owen. Um, we did some changes, uh, mm -hmm. lifestyle changes. He's gluten free. We know he was tested. Uh, he is gluten sensitive. Uh, so we removed that. We noticed an immediate change. Um, <clears throat> we started him on supplements. Mm -hmm. 
uh, different vitamins and you know the exercises that, that we do when we come here uh, as well as the home exercises that the doctors recommend uh, we do all of those things now on a regular basis and Owen has made again you know like this magnificent change you know that we just I've never seen before um, you know, he's 12 now and it really feels like for the first time you know I have like this this, this little person who you know, I never really got to meet before. I mean, it may sound odd, but like it's, it really feels like that because for so many years, you know, he was, it was a struggle. A struggle would be putting it lightly. You know, every you, every day you're walking on eggshells. You never knew what was going to happen. You never knew what kind of day he had. Mm -hmm. You know, and it really affected us too from the family act and the family end of things because you know, like any parent, the kind of day your kid has is the kind of day you have. Right. So when he did good, I did good. When he did bad. We all did bad, so. So Dr. this has impacted your life, though. Dr. Durs and Dr. Child's treatments, and then everybody that works here, everything that you guys have all done has mm -hmm. had a tremendous impact on Owen. He's recognized it. You know, when he start started to see the changes, mm -hmm. that was the key. When he started to see himself acting differently than how he was before, man, he he jumped right on board. Um, it's still a challenge. Uh, he's it's 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 not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, the diet is difficult. It requires it requires commitment, and it is hard. It's hard to tell your kid no that he can't have birthday cake at the birthday party when all the other kids are having birthday cake. Mm -hmm. But the payoff is much greater. You know, it's either have the birthday cake and suffer the consequences, and I've seen that firsthand, having made those mistakes. But it can be done. You know, it you can't give up. But it is a huge commitment uh, to to do. But it's absolutely worth it. So. I would definitely recommend to anyone having any second guesses or, or looking into it, come here and give it a shot because it's, in our case, it has been life changing for Owen and for us. So I just want to thank you guys and, you know, thank you. That's all I have to say. I don't know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for bringing Owen here. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. So, uh, what complaints did you have prior to coming to the office? Um, our son, who is four, was four when we started care, was extremely hyperactive, very impulsive, um, very angry, and was really hard, had difficulty focusing. Okay. And um, how long has he had this hyperactivity impulsiveness? I noticed he was hyperactive from when he was an infant, from like baby six months old, crawling around. If he wasn't climbing or destroying something, he wasn't doing anything. He never sat and played with toys. Okay. Um, I noticed it even more when we started homeschooling, um, which was right around when we, we brought him here to be evaluated. Um, trying to sit and do school, he would not. He would run from one side of the room to the other and jump and not, I could not, he would not sit and color a picture ever. Okay. And um, what, what was the effect um, in your family life and at home and everything? The hardest part was one, getting him to actually sit and focus on either what you were trying to tell him, what you wanted him to do, um, and then he was so impulsive whenever we would try to keep him from doing what it was he had the um, impulses to do, he would just completely blow up, no self-control, be angry, scream, um, and that was very difficult trying to take him out anywhere. In the middle of the grocery store, he would be screaming if I wouldn't let him touch everything in the row. Okay. And um, since having care with Dr. Childs and Dr. Durr, what has improved? Everything. He will sit and color a picture now until it's done. He'll even ask to color another one. Um, he focuses on his schoolwork. He will sit in his desk and watch his video and do his papers. Um, he has much fewer temper tantrums. Um, and even when he has them, it's so much easier to calm him down. Um, and he doesn't even do the annoying little impulsive things like slapping my arm when I would talk to him. Great. And um, how is this impacting your life and family life? So much more peaceful and quiet. And we can go out and do the things we want to do. And I don't have to worry about him having a tantrum everywhere we go or tearing something up. <laughs> Great. And um, any other thoughts on your experience um, at the office with the doctors, the staff, anything like that? It's all been wonderful. Everybody's been very friendly and 
explained everything to us and very helpful. It's been a wonderful experience. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marianne. What health complaints did your grandson have prior to coming to the office? He was um, diagnosed, he's seven and a half, was diagnosed with ADHD, and um, some of the um, spectrum disorders. He um, started here at six and a half, and this is after about two years of trying to read, uh, research, and everything else, and there was always this missing part that we just couldn't see and realize. And um, seeing the infomercial that Dr. Childs had last year, uh, it was just like light at the end of the tunnel for us. So we came up for a visit, loved the office, and um, had him tested here for different things and um, the blood work and all. and found out that he was gluten sensitive and we already had the red dye and all those other sensitivities checked into before coming here but we didn't know that the gluten would impact so much and um, switching his diet and doing the exercises the metronome we called them floor exercises to the point when we went to playgrounds he would do the balance beam on the curb he just he incorporated that into his daily life all by himself. To, and he also, whenever anybody would ask him, would you like this or that to eat, he would always say, is it gluten free? And um, he's grown up so much emotionally over this past year, which is tremendous. It's just been tremendous. He went from tantruming anywhere to three times a week for it could have been a half an hour to five hour episodes three times a week's a lot to hardly anything now it, it, he has these tiny little I don't want to do this and you can redirect him within five minutes that was simply unheard of a year ago he's it took time three months, six months, he started gradually getting into easier to redirect and um, he's doing tremendously well in school where his, he's a second grader but his uh, scholastic scores are in the third grade level. So he's brought that up and um, it's just his overall well-being that's improved greatly which leads us to our quality of life too because it, it's like really great being able to say Alex you have five more minutes and then we have to go to the next task and he might give you a little bit of I have to go to the bathroom or I want a little break and I do let him get up and he does his exercises between subjects doing homework and it's just the greatest routine ever that we will being here with Dr. Child and Dr. Durr and all their staff has given us a new path and a new direction to take and uh, we're really enjoying it. It's, um, it's just opened our eyes to a different way of life without medication and that's something we never wanted to do. We never wanted to put him on that medication. And I'm glad we didn't because he's turned around and he's a normal little boy with all of his little normal things at, with the tantruming aside. And he knows that too. He'll do his deep breathing exercises when he feels that he's getting overwhelmed when he's transitioning. And these are, these are coping skills that he can take throughout his life. And I'm so glad we introduced this to him at seven and a half because I know a lot of adults that could use this training and um, we're very very happy with the outcome and it's it's a lifelong thing it's not something that you sign up for a year and over and done with these are abilities 
that he can take throughout the, the next 60 years of his life, 70 years. And um, the exercises are very oriented so that because of his left brain needing a little bit more stimulation. But these are all tasks that he can do that it's not going to kill him to run a marathon. He can do these simple exercises every day. And we do. We just get together and 15 minutes, you're done. I mean, a TV program <laughs> takes longer than 15 minutes, you know? And it's just, we just have it scheduled and timed and, you know, we either do them in the morning. It's flexible during throughout the day, but we always have them done before we go to bed. That's, he's just um, really good with them because he even reminds me, are we doing the metronome tonight? Well, we do the metronome every other day, but it was like, no, we're doing the floor exercises next, you know, but he, he really wants to, um, he wants to improve his life. And at seven and a half, it's great to see that. Absolutely. And um, that's pretty much all the questions that you rolled up into one, which was great. Um, but any other thoughts on the experience in the office with Dr. Childs or the staff, anything like that? Very flexible. Uh, we've come all the way from Philadelphia and um, always gave me the schedule I needed, knowing the traffic would be outrageous <laughs> sometimes on the turnpike. Never had a bit of problem with anything. I love it here. I'm going to really miss everyone, and so is Alex. All but, right. um yeah, uh, and they even have a little children's room because he just loved that playroom. Aww, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>